You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone and welcome to a Bible Answer today. My name is Mike McDaniel and I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Thanks for being with us today. We have three gospel preachers to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. My name is David Lemons. I'm the preacher for the Maple Hill Church of Christ near Benton, Kentucky. I'm Serge Shoemaker. I'm one of the ministers for the Glendale Church of Christ in New Bern, Tennessee. My name is Justin Pascoe, and I'm the preacher for the Ripley Church of Christ in Ripley, Tennessee. We're glad to have each of these brethren with us today to answer your questions. We've got some great questions today. Let's get right to them. Our first question goes to Brother David Lemons. Brother Lemons, can the devil make a person do something against his will? Brother Lemons. Well, I would uh, say I'm probably date myself with these younger men that are here with us today, but Flip Wilson used to say the devil made him do it whatever, whenever he did something bad. But um, the fact is, if we believe that the God of the Bible is a just God, then uh, this uh, would not be possible that someone would be able to make us to do something that would condemn us, would cause us to be lost. I know that... Um, the God of the Bible is a just God. The way that we learn about the attributes of God, of course, is to read in the Bible. And uh, we want to notice two or three passages that tell us that God is a just God. Uh, but how could a just God hold me accountable for something that someone else made me to do is the uh, idea that we would set forth. You know, uh, in the discussion that Abraham had with the Lord, with regard to the cities of the plain, he was making an appeal to the Lord that those cities might be spared, Sodom and Gomorrah, the other cities. And in the book of Genesis chapter 18 and verse 25, we read these words, that be far from thee to do after this manner to, stay the, to slay the righteous with the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And of course, that's a rhetorical question, and Abraham certainly recognized that God is a just God. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32 and verse 4, another time that we learn about the justice of God, He is the rock, His work is perfect, for all His ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is He. And then Psalm 89, verse 14 says, Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne, mercy and truth shall go before thy face. And so the key word in the question, I suppose, would be make. Can the devil make me do that which I don't want to do or wouldn't want to do? If, if Satan can make me to sin, and then as a result of that, to be lost with him in the eternity of hell, then uh, that would speak uh, against the claims that the Bible makes that God is a God of justice. For well, that proposition to be true, we would expect that maybe righteous souls, people that want others to be saved, might go out and find people. And if they are a little bigger than them, they could bring them to the church building, throw them in the baptistry, and, and they'd be saved as a result. It'd be about the same way of thinking. But of course, we do not believe that that is the case. I would uh, close the case, the argument about whether or not Satan has such power as that by turning to one of my very favorite passages in the Bible, which would be 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, where the Apostle Paul is making a promise. And notice as we read the promise that it's based upon the faithfulness of God. Let's read 1 Corinthians 10, verse number 13. The Bible says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So that promise that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth originally and to us as we read it and study it today <clears throat> is a promise based upon the faithfulness of God and he is saying that nobody, Satan, 
included, nobody is able to cause me to sin, to cause me to do something that, that uh, I don't want to do. If I commit sin today, it is because I make the choice to do that. And so none of us have to worry about someone, Satan, or anyone else making us do something that we don't want to do. We can resist that. There'll be a way to escape. Maybe, a, maybe we have to look hard to find that way of escape sometimes because Satan is powerful in presenting temptation to us in such a good-looking way. But uh, we cannot be forced to sin. And so that's a great question. Thank you for giving that to us. Thank you, Brother Lemons. And that's certainly true. The devil doesn't have any power to make us do anything against our will. And I was thinking that uh, Flip Wilson's material for his comedy sketch was hardly original because you remember what Eve said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. She tried to put the blame on the serpent, which was the tool used by the devil. But she was deceived, allowed herself to be deceived, and was in the transgression. The next uh, question for Brother Shoemaker today. Why is Judas called the son of perdition in John chapter 17 and verse 12? Brother Shoemaker. John 17, 12 is part of Jesus' high priestly prayer, offered up the night in which he was betrayed. The text reads, While I was with them, I kept them in thy name which thou hast given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. The son of perdition clearly refers to Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would betray Jesus to the Sanhedrin. But what does this phrase mean, and what is its significance? In all likelihood, perdition is not part of your regular vocabulary. The original Greek term describes complete destruction, the idea of annihilation. Thus, the modern English term perdition refers to eternal damnation. The phrase son of and then some trait is a Hebrew idiom referring to a person who is characterized by that trait. For example, Barnabas was the son of exhortation, Acts 4 and verse 36, one who was known for his encouraging personality. And Jesus nicknamed James and John sons of thunder, Mark, 37, or Mark 3 and verse 17, presumably for their propensity for outburst. I invite you to look at Luke 9 and verse 54, where they would have called down fire from heaven upon the Samaritans. So Judas, as son of perdition, had become characterized as making decisions that would lead one to eternal destruction. Remember that Judas had for some time been skimming from the disciples' treasury, according to John 12 and verse 6. Identifying Judas as the son of perdition is simply to say that he was living like the lost. That lifestyle would ultimately lead to Judas' destruction. Jesus himself said, The Son of Man goeth, even as it is written of him. But woe unto that man through whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good word for that man if he had not been born. Matthew 26, 24. But what is the significance of the phrase, and how does it relate to the idea that the Scripture might be fulfilled? Some take this to mean that Judas was destined to fall, that his actions were somehow unavoidable. Such an idea is completely at odds with Scripture. God does not desire or will for any person to be lost, but wants all men to be saved eternally. Paul wrote, 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 4, that God would have all men to be saved. And similarly, Peter says in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, that God is not wishing that any should perish. Furthermore, God cannot, and indeed does not, tempt anyone to commit an act of evil, as we read in James 1 and verse 13. Judas was not compelled to betray Jesus, either by God or by prophecy. Instead, it would be more accurate to say that God anticipated the actions of Judas, and that anticipation was reflected in God's inspired prophecy. Judas' fall was the result of his freely chosen actions and those actions alone. What we can take from this statement is that nothing is a surprise to God. Yes, one of Jesus' closest associates betrayed him and fell away, but that action was foreknown and even used to accomplish God's plan. 
I thank you for this question and hope you have found this to be a Bible answer. We've reached the halfway point of our program today, and we want to offer to you a free tract. Our tract today is entitled, How Could a Loving God Punish People Eternally? If you'd like to have this free tract, or if you'd like to have our eight-lesson Bible correspondence course on the Church of the Bible, all of our materials are absolutely free here at A Bible Answer. If you want them or if you'd like to send us your question, just contact us. Write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may email us at a Bible Answer at earthlink.net. Or you may call our toll-free number 1-800-436-0463 and request these materials or give us your question. If you get the answer machine and you're requesting materials, please leave your full address and a good clear voice. We're also pointing people to our web address www.abibleanswertv.com. You can go there. You can submit questions by means of our website and you can also by means of our YouTube channel uh, view past programs of a Bible answer there. Back to our questions now to Brother Pascal for his first question. Is it really possible to love one's enemies? Brother Pascal. Let's begin by getting one of the passages that refer to this commandment before us. In Matthew chapter 5 beginning in verse 43, Jesus said, You have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth his rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans do the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. The first thing that I would say in response to this question is to consider the fact that if Jesus commands us to do something, then friends, it is definitely possible for us to obey that commandment. Our Lord never commands us to do something that we are unable to do. Now, there's a quote that I read a long time ago that has always stuck with me. God does not command His followers to do something and then leave them unequipped or ill-equipped to accomplish that task. I think maybe the problem that you might be having with this commandment is an understanding of the definition of the word love. In the Greek, they had numerous words that translate into our one English word, love. There was the Greek word eros, which was a love between a husband and a wife. It's from which we get the uh, English word erotic. So it was a romantic type of love. There was the Greek word phileo, which I know many are familiar with, and has a reference to a friendship love. There was also the Greek word storge, which was a familial type of love. But none of these are the love that was commanded by God in this passage. The word here is the Greek word agape. In Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, he says this about agape love. Christian love, whether exercised toward the brethren or toward men generally, is not an impulse from the feelings. It does not always run with the natural inclinations, nor does it spend itself only upon those for whom some affinity is discovered. Love seeks the welfare of all and works no ill to any. Love seeks opportunity to do good to all men, and especially toward them that are of the household of faith. This is a type of love that is not dependent on the person we are loving. It is a type of love that is based off of us. God loved agape us while we were yet sinners. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. And so this is a love that we can have towards our enemies because it is based off the fact that I am a Christian, a child of God. I want to give you one practical suggestion before we close with this question. In seeking to love your enemies, one of the best things that I believe that you can do is to pray for them. Uh, praying for that individual will help to alleviate any hard feelings in your heart. And it will also hopefully help them 
to see that you do care about them and want what is best for them. Not only is it possible for us to love our enemies, friends, in order to live faithfully as a child of God, we must do so. I want to thank you for this question. Thank you, Brother Pascal, for that good answer. Our next question to Brother Lemons. How does one go about proving the age, the existence of an age of accountability in the Bible? Brother Lemons. Well, one thing that does not help is to um, look it up in the concordance or a Bible app, that phrase, not, not found. The word accountability itself, uh, I find no hits on that either. But um, I tried looking up the meaning of the word accountability and in an old uh, edition of the Webster's Dictionary of American English, the first uh, definition for the word accountability is this, the state of being liable to answer for one's conduct. And so uh, I'm thinking that this question is seeking to find a Bible answer, which is a good name for a TV program, a Bible answer for the question of whether or not there's a certain age when a young person begins to uh, be liable to answer for their behavior uh, before God, the God of heaven. Chris Clevenger gives a, a good uh, definition, I think, of the age of accountability and the concept of it. He writes this, the time in the development of a person when he or she can, can and invariably does sin against God and thus stands in need of personal redemption through Jesus Christ. Uh, this question, of course, has troubled the hearts of many young couples with children, and uh, it's been asked of me many times uh, in connection with specific people. The um, preacher says in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. We're wise to encourage our children to put God first in their lives and to train them in, in the scriptures. Frankly, the Bible just does not give to us a specific age at which a young person should begin to have concern about the state of their spiritual welfare before God. We should consider those some principles, some passages that give us some idea about how to deal with th this situation when we face it in our lives. One of the things that is important for us is not to generalize because the abilities, the knowledge, the training, the teaching of various individual children does vary so much. And so to set a hard and fast rule would not be appropriate. One of the principles though that is so essential to consider in discussing this matter, the age of accountability, would be the, the fact that baptism does involve such a serious commitment. The words of Jesus in Matthew 10, verse 37 are these, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And so the young person that is beginning to think about the matter of being baptized into Christ to wash away their sins, uh, being equipped physically and mentally and emotionally for such a serious commitment must be considered by them. We must help them to understand the serious commitment that is involved when one becomes a child of God, uh, being baptized into Christ. And uh, so the, the child needs to consider carefully that kind of commitment. The last few verses of Luke chapter 14, Jesus says three times that one is not, you cannot be my disciple. So you have to count the cost and it is a cost, there is a cost involved in becoming a disciple of the Lord. Another principle to think about is that baptism is for those who are lost. Baptism is for those who are lost and uh, Calvinism notwithstanding, babies are not born into this world as little sinners. I recently uh, had a little granddaughter added to the two, grand, the, the one I already had. And, and the, the idea that that little baby is a, a little sinner is just so faulty and so wrong. It's nowhere taught in the Bible. They're innocent. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so the innocence of the children certainly is pointed out there by our Lord. If a child understands 
the difference between what's right and what is wrong and, and they know that they have chosen to do the wrong and then they begin to feel guilty and, and sorry for that wrong. Then uh, they might begin to think about considering baptism. Uh, proper baptism requires understanding what baptism is. Christianity is a taught religion. Baptism is a spiritual birth and, and certainly everyone needs to understand that. One needs to understand it before it can be valid. Wayne Jackson wrote this. He is quoting from Gus Nichols. He said, Gus Nichols used to point out that belief in Jesus as the virgin born son of God is essential to being baptized in a scriptural fashion. He would then observe that one cannot endorse the concept of the virgin birth unless he is able to comprehend the process of a natural birth. And we would say, you know, right there would, would cut into the knowledge of some very young children. That wouldn't really be a part of their knowledge base. His major point was this, becoming a Christian depends upon being adequately taught, understanding what is taught, and being committed to a threshold of some very significant doctrinal truths. And this goes beyond a, a mere recital of often rehearsed phrases. So we would simply suggest that there should be a great deal of caution used in making decisions regarding age of accountability because salvation is indeed such a very serious matter. Thank you so much for the good question. Thank you, Brother Lemons, and now to Brother Shoemaker. How can we go forth unto the Lord without the camp, as Hebrews 13, 13 states? Brother Shoemaker. In order to fully answer this question, I want us to take a moment to consider both the immediate context of the passage and the broader context of the book of Hebrews as a whole. First, let us note the surrounding verses. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us therefore go forth unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 11 and following. Verse 11 points back to the annual Day of Atonement, described in Leviticus 26, in which a bull was offered for the sacrifice of the priest, and a goat as a sin offering for the people. Both of these animals were slaughtered within the camp, and their blood sprinkled upon the instruments of worship. But their bodies were taken outside of the camp and completely consumed by fire. Verse 12 then compares this ancient practice with the sacrifice of Jesus, who was crucified outside the city walls of Jerusalem at nearby Golgotha. Verse 13 encourages the original audience, and us by extension, to similarly be willing to go without the camp. When we consider the broader context of the letter to the Hebrews, we can understand the original implications of this phrase. You may recall that the book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians who were feeling pressure to separate from Christ and turn back to Judaism. It is in this context that the Hebrews writer says we must be willing to go without the camp and bear reproach just as the Lord Jesus did. For the original audience, this likely meant enduring separation from Jewish family, friends, neighbors, Hebrews 13, 14 seems to support this interpretation. For we have not here an abiding city, that is, Jerusalem is not our city, but we seek after the city which is to come. Now how can this verse apply to us today? Well, is it the case that we might have to separate ourselves from the camp of what is comfortable and familiar in order that we might fully serve Christ? Certainly it is. Jesus Himself said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or a daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that doth not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, verses 37 and 38. We should be prepared to go without the camp of our family and our friends that we might fully observe the commands of Christ. It may very, very well be that for us, going without the camp means obeying the gospel by being baptized into Christ Jesus even over the objections of family. It may mean speaking where the Bible speaks, on topics that society would rather not address, topics such as divorce and remarriage, or homosexuality. 
The general meaning of going without the camp is that we must be prepared to be different and distinct from the world around us and be willing to proudly hold up the cause of Christ regardless of the reproach that may be cast our way. After all, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified with Him, according to Romans 8 and verse 17. Thank you for this excellent question. I'm thankful to each of these good brethren for doing such a great job today in uh, answering these very good questions. That's a very interesting question that Serge just answered and, and gave a very good answer to. You know, the Jews had rejected Christ and they cast Him outside of the camp. But the temple and all that it stood for remained inside Jerusalem, inside the, the camp of Israel. And since Christ was outside that whole thing, there couldn't be any communion with Christ uh, inside the Judaistic system. They had to come out to Christ, come out to the cross. That's where the place for the, the Hebrew believer was with Jesus Christ. And outside all of that, for which Judaism stood. They would have to leave the camp of Judaism, leave those animal sacrifices, and come to the cross if they would be sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul said in Galatians 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness has come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. We know that camp was literally destroyed uh, in A.D. 70. And what Old Testament system does the modern Jew have today? No high priest, no priest, no temple, no altar, no tribal identity, no prophets, no scriptural worship, and no hope without Jesus Christ. Friends, we need Jesus Christ in our life. We need to be willing to come outside the camp of Judaism and go out to the cross, to Calvary, to the place of rejection, to the place of reproach, and be willing to bear His humiliation. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.